it there. All right. Pastor Price, I wonder if I might be able to have a little bit of fun with these boys for a few minutes. Would that be all right? Yes. All right. All right. Sounds yeah. good. Boys, want to get your hymnals. Get your hymnals, the songbooks that you just had. Go back to that song we were just singing, page 125. All right? Everybody, every, every teenager needs a hymnal. Do you have one? Everybody need one? You need one? We got, we need two, I think, maybe right here. Make sure they get a hymnal. Turn back to that uh, 125, Jesus paid it all. Emily, I want to ask you to come to the piano. Just make sure you can get the, the chorus notes. We just seen the top notes there, Jesus paid it all on the chorus, right? It's five flat, so take a look at it. My wife, I didn't tell my wife she was going to play the piano today, so I'll give her just a minute to make sure she's she's got it there. Hey, I just want to say something. When I was a teenager, I was very deceived about something concerning music, okay? I thought that it was a sissy thing to sing. I did. You know, it wasn't popular where I went for men to sing, okay? So as a result, um, when it was in a service like this or something like that, I would always kind of, you know, lower my head and I wouldn't really want to, I wouldn't want to be singing. Right, and uh, you know what happened? I really missed out. Right, and uh, then I, you know, I, I grew up. I started studying the Bible. Well, the Bible talks about a man by the name of David who was a man after God's own heart. And you know what? Of all things about David, he loved music, and he was good at music. He played different instruments. He sang. He wrote music. I mean, it was really cool. And when you just think about Christianity in general, how many religions get together and sing? They don't sing. You know what? Christians sing, right? If you know God, you need to sing, okay? And uh, singing is something that is fun. But singing is also something that not everybody understands and knows what's going on, right? So I'm just curious. How many of you guys know how to read music? Say, I understand the notes on the page. A little bit back there, a little bit right here, a little bit. Some of you are like, I have no idea what I'm looking at when I see this. Would that be true? Would that be true? All right. I want to give you a, a short music lesson if I can. And uh, we're just going to look there at the chorus, all right? So you have uh, there with Jesus paid it all. The chorus starts down in the middle right there at Jesus paid it all, all right? Now, if you look, there's a set of four notes on the page, all right? There's the top note, bottom note on the top little graph there, and then the top note and the bottom note on the bottom little graph. Everybody see that? The note that you're singing is the top one, okay? That's how you know whether you're not the next note is higher or lower than the one that you're on. All right, Emily, give me the Jesus note, G. All right? That's what it's supposed to sound like, right? Give me just the, the, the G. All right, everybody's like, G. Say the, make it sound like that. Can you make your voice sound like that? All right, here's something else I was deceived about this, and I didn't learn this until I was 34 years old. What? I thought that there were people who were just naturally gifted with the ability to sing. Like they were born that way, and they could just hit all the right notes. And when I was 34, 34 years old, somebody said, no, what, you have to practice in order to learn to be able to sing. But anybody can learn to sing. I thought that was pretty cool. I didn't know that. You know what? Since then, since 34, I'm 38 now, for the last four years, I've been really trying to learn how to sing. I'm still not very good at it, you know? But that's okay, right? I'm singing and I'm getting better, right? So that Jesus note there, right? It would, when you say Jesus, when you, finish the, when you finish Jesus, would the next note be a little higher or, or a little bit lower? According to the notes there. Would it be higher or lower? Right. Higher. higher. Right? So it's Jesus paid it all. You seen that? Oh, actually, Jesus paid it all. Just right? See? All goes really high, right? Jesus paid it all. Right? Can you guys do that? Let me hear it. Let me hear it. Come on, this is fun, right? You embarrassed? I'm embarrassing you. This is so much fun for me. I am having the time of my life, Pastor Price. You should, you should have never let me do this. All right, ready? Here we go, ready? Jesus paid all. you got to get way up there. Now, it's important. When you hit a note like all, you have to give it your all. All right, if you go, Jesus paid it all. If you try to be quiet because you're not sure you're going to hit it, you won't hit it, and it's going to sound awful. Right? So what you do is when you get to some note like that, and you've got a good song leader like Charlie, who he can hit the note, just pay attention to wherever he is, and then go for it with everything you've got, and then hit the note. Right? And you know what? 
if you don't hit the note, it'll be fine anyway, right? So here's what we're gonna do. Uh, she's gonna play the piano. Just play it one time for them, all right? All right, now, that's what I want you guys to do, all right? And I want you, when it goes to the all, I want you to sing it like you mean it, all right? Are you ready? Yeah. All right, you guys having fun? I'm gonna sing it with you, all right? So this is, this is fun for me too, ready? All right, Jesus paid it all. All right, good, all right, very good. Now let's keep going. All to him I owe. You know, now, do you see it on the page why we're going to the direction that we're going? That's the way the notes go. All to him I owe. Right? Oh, oh, oh. Well, whatever. I can't hit the notes either, right? All right? Then go ahead and do Sin had left a crimson stain. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. You ought to sing, and you ought to sing, and when you sing, like belt it out, sing, like Charlie does whenever he's leading music. I was listening to Charlie leading music, and I'm like, man, this is fantastic. Every church in the United States of America and everywhere else, they need a song leader that's going to belt it out like Charlie, right? Because he's just singing, and he's singing for the Lord, right? You don't have to sing to impress Charlie. You don't sing to impress Brother Lee. Don't sing to impress Pastor Price. Yes, you won't. Sing to the Lord, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, just sing to the Lord, all right? All right, here we go. So this is, we're going to sing just the uh, just chorus there all together, and everybody's got to sing to the top of your capabilities, all right? Just sing it out. Ready? Ready? All right, here we go. Just on the chorus there. Jesus made it all. But I heard a lot of voices over here, and some of the teenagers fell out on me. And you know what that means normally when somebody falls out on me? That means they've got to do it by themselves. Yeah. yeah. All right. So nobody fall out, right? Everybody together, just the teenagers and me. I'll sing with you, all right, on that same part, right? I want you guys to sing it and sound better than all the rest of these guys did just now. Ready? Ready? Ready to go? Ready? Jesus paid it all. All. I'm glad that nobody fell out because I was going to make you come up here and do it next time. <laughs> so that's good. But then you know what? Sing, right? Sing. You've got a lot to sing about. If you know the Lord Jesus yes. Christ, then you should sing. I appreciate you guys letting me to do that with you a little bit. But you know what? Look at those notes. Know whether or not it goes up and down. And understand how it works. Thank you, Emily, for letting me call you up here and, and uh, play just a little bit. It's a lot of fun. Music is great. And uh, if you don't understand it, you know, start learning it. And uh, you're never going to learn to sing if you don't try to learn to sing. And um, it, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun, so it's good. All right, 1 Peter chapter 2, all right? We're going to look at the first three verses, but we're going to start in verse number 3. All right, so look in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse number 3. The Bible starts with a big word in the New Testament, but it's only got two letters. What is it? <coughs> if. If. Okay? If. All right, so in other words, the Bible is saying here... Um, if what's if, if verse three isn't true, you don't have to do what's in verses one and two, okay? But this is just a conditional statement here, so let's look at it. it says verse verse number three says, "If so be ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious." Now, what we're going to be talking about this morning is growth. Every Christian must do whatever it takes to grow. Amen. Do whatever it takes to grow. Uh, Pastor Price mentioned this morning uh, from the pulpit in some kind of announcement or something. He said, you know what? He says, um, Christian or, or teenagers have a great potential for growth. Yes. To make the decisions and to be able to grow in the Lord. You know what? All of us have that potential. And we need to be making the decisions that we need to be making in our life in order to grow. All right, now growth is something that is observable, right? And we see growth all of around, all around us, don't we? Uh, we see it everywhere that we look in nature. I see it in, in my children. I have two girls. They're ages 10 and 12 now. One of them just had a birthday. And I'm always trying to figure out a way to keep them from growing, to keep them small. Right, Lee? And she's like, why can't all my children just stay small? Right? I'm, I'm threatening them. You know, I'm going to put a 
put a brick on your head and I'm going to stop you from growing, right? But you know what? It, it won't. It just doesn't work. Those kids just grow. And you know what? To be honest, I mean, we expect and anticipate growth, don't we? We expect that a child, we don't expect you to be the same height the next time we see you next year if we get invited back, right? You're going to grow. And that's what everybody in this room would be expecting. And that he would be bigger next year than he is this year. When I was going into the 8th grade, I was the shortest boy in my 8th grade class at school. Because you didn't go to high school. Because I didn't go to your school. You, might, you were shorter, huh? Short. Sure. And I was this little, this little old guy, you know? And then by the time I got to ninth grade, I was probably about average height. And by the time I was in 10th grade, I was one of the tallest kids in my class. But I'm telling you, from 8th to 10th grade, I shot up like, I mean, just, just crazy. I mean, my mom, I had to buy, I had to buy new, complete wardrobe to go to school. Not every school year, but every half of the school year. Because I had nothing that I had fit anymore. I was just growing like crazy. And uh, teenage boys, I'm telling you, you can grow and you can eat, and that's just the way that it goes. But you know what? We expect to see growth. Um, you guys know what kudzu vines are, by any chance? They know what kudzu is down here? Some of you guys do. There's a vine, there's a vine up uh, in the Carolinas where I'm at. I think it's in other places too. But it will grow over 12 inches in a day, a vine. And it's just crazy. And it's a wild vine, and uh, you'll drive by somewhere on the road, and you'll see you know, a few kudzu vines that are going up a tree, right? You'll just spot it, right? In all these beautiful areas, trees, you know, nice forests that are there, you'll see a couple of kudzu vines. You drive back by there in two or three months and you'll have kudzu for a quarter of a mile, right? I mean, it just takes over, it kills the trees, it kills everything, it just grows like crazy, you know? Growth is natural, growth is anticipated, but uh, it's not normal when we don't see growth, right? That's not normal. Um, Mrs. Price is trying to grow some pineapples, okay? And so what you do, you ch chop the tops off of those pineapples and she's got them set up there and uh, she's expecting those things to have some roots that grow there and they're gonna plant those pineapples and then have those things reproduce, right? So she's expecting to see something happen there. But if nothing happens, um, she's gonna know something's wrong. She's just gonna get rid of that pineapple thing. She said, well, that didn't work, you know, and, and move on. But growth is something that we anticipate. And not seeing growth is not normal. Now, for a kid, all a kid's got to do is just eat a little bit, and he's, he's just, he's just going to grow. It's, it's just natural. It's just going to happen. But for a Christian, and this is what I want everybody in here to understand, for a Christian to grow, it has to be on purpose. It doesn't just happen. We're used to growth just kind of being automatic. But for a Christian to grow, it's not automatic. It's not just going to happen. You know, it is possible also for a, there to be a Christian who has been saved for, let's make up a, a year, let's say a Christian has been saved for 40 years. That's a long time, isn't it? Longer than you teenagers have been alive. Longer than I have been alive, come to think of it. But not longer than Pastor Price has been alive. But at any rate, it's possible, it's possible for a Christian to have been saved for 40 years and to not be growing in the Lord. At the same point in time, it is possible for a Christian to have been saved three days and to just be growing in the Lord. That's interesting, isn't it? It is possible for that to be the case. Our text here is talking about growth. And it um, says here in verse number 3, um, verse number 2 is talking about growing in the Lord, and then verse number 3 is giving us the reason or the cause that we would want to grow in the Lord. And it says there, if so be ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Now this is a question that we need to ask ourselves. Have you tasted? Have you experienced? Do you know that the Lord is gracious? Do you know that? Is the Lord gracious? Is the Lord good? Do you know that for certain in your life? If you're saved, if you've been forgiven of your sins, then you ought to know that the Lord is gracious. The Lord is good, isn't He? We could talk the rest, of, uh, the rest of today today about reasons that the Lord is gracious. But just to limit ourselves and to uh, confine ourselves in the subject area, we'll just talk about what chapter 1 of verse number Peter says about the Lord's graciousness. All right. So look at it there in verse number 3. Uh, chapter 1, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse number 3. 
The Bible says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. You know what? I am so thankful that God is merciful. Are you thankful that God is merciful? You know, mercy means that we don't get what we deserve. I am so thankful that I don't get what I deserve. I deserve to spend an eternity in hell. I didn't do anything to deserve the Lord's forgiveness. I didn't do anything to earn or merit my way into heaven. But I am so thankful that He is merciful. You know, after I got saved, I still need the Lord's mercy. Because I'm still pathetic, and I'm still rotten, and I'm still weak. And I still don't do all the things that I should do for the Lord. But you know what? God is merciful. And He still uses me in the ministry. And what a, what a blessing that is, yes. you know? And uh, God is merciful. And I have tasted God's mercy. And I hope that you have too, right? God is merciful. Look in verse number 4 there. Um, the Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 1, and verse number 4, it says there, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fate is not away, reserved in heaven for you. Now, it's also, that's the kind of continuation of the thought in verse number 3, that he hath begotten us unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible. This is fascinating to me. If you're saved, there's an inheritance waiting for you in heaven. Did you do anything to deserve that inheritance? No, you didn't. But it's there. It's waiting for you. The Bible talks about heaven is the most beautiful place you've ever seen or ever imagined, and you can't even imagine all the things that are there. The streets are paved with gold in heaven. I, mean, I, just, I just can't imagine, right? And you know, everything that we're used to here, everything that we're used to here is corruptible. It fades away, right? It's not incorruptible. It's corruptible, all right? Um, you, you buy a new car, and you drive it off the lot, and it's not new anymore, is it? You're driving down the road, you buy yourself some coffee, and then you spill coffee in your car, and your brand new car's got its coffee stain on it. It's already been corrupted, right? As soon as you buy that new car and drive it off the lot, it's not worth half of what you paid for it. It's already lost value. It's already being corrupted. It's already being driven it. You're ruining it, right? You buy a brand new house. Doesn't matter. It's going to get corrupt. Things are going to break. Your air conditioning's not going to work. Your refrigerator's going to go out. Everything that we have here in this world comes to an end. Your clothes get old. They get used. They wear out. They get holes in them. You have to buy new clothes. But the Bible says that our inheritance in Jesus Christ, not because we deserve it, but our inheritance in Jesus Christ is incorruptible. I mean, that's amazing to me. It's never going to fade away. It's never going to get ruined. It's always going to be perfect. Man, I'm telling you, that is exciting. God is gracious. He didn't have to do that for us, but He did. He's given to us an inheritance that is incorruptible. Look in verse number 5. I love this. The Bible says there, "...who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time." You know, there's a lot of people that think whenever they trust Jesus Christ as their Savior, that they have to keep themselves saved. You understand what I mean by that? So let's say a person uh, gets saved and they, they believe in Jesus Christ to be forgiven of their sins and then they think, well, in order to stay saved and, and still in order to go to heaven one day, then I'm going to have to go to church and I'm going to have to do what's right and I'm going to have to et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and go down the list. I'm going to have to be baptized and all these things in order to keep myself saved. But that is not what the Bible says in this verse. It's God's graciousness that keeps you saved. God is the one that keeps you saved. Look at it there. In verse number 5 it says, You are kept by whose power? The power of God. Now everybody look up here just for a minute. Here's what a lot of people think. All right? They think that, um, let's let this hand represent God here. All right? And we'll let this hand represent us. They think that when a person gets saved, right, and they're forgiven of their sins, that they are hanging on to God. Okay? And then, um, as time goes by, you know, they think that, uh, you know, if they're not doing right or whatever, they may, they may start losing their grip on God. And they, and they begin uh, not doing the things that they need to do, and they aren't as faithful, and they're not witnessing, and they're not reading their Bible, and all these different things. You know what? After time, they lose their grip on God, and they, and they fall away. And they think that they can lose their salvation. But you know what? That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that we're kept by the power of God. The Bible doesn't teach that we're hanging on to God. 
the Bible teaches that God is hanging on to us. The picture is a little bit different. Let's let this represent us now. All right? Well, actually, let's let this represent us. The Bible says that when we get saved, God has hold of us. We are in His hand. And the Bible tells us in John chapter 10, verses 28 and 29, that no man can pluck us out of the Father's hand. Not you, not your decisions, not Pastor Price, not his decisions, not anybody's decisions. No man can pluck you out of the Father's hands. He has a hold of you. And he is the one that keeps you saved. I am so thankful that I don't have to keep myself saved. That would be miserable, wouldn't it? I might lose my salvation every day. Uh, that would be no way to live. There would be no peace. There would be no uh, security. It would be an awful, terrible way to live to think that you could lose your salvation. You know what? God is gracious and God is good and He is better to us than we deserve and I'm so thankful for His mercy. I'm thankful for His salvation. I'm thankful for everything about the Lord and I'm thankful that He is the one who maintains my salvation. And I can get fired up about that. That's pretty exciting. All right, look in uh, chapter 1. And lo over and look in verse number 16. The Bible says there, Because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. You know, I take comfort in knowing the fact that God is holy. You know, God's always right. He's always righteous. He always makes the right decision. He always knows the right thing to say. He always knows the right thing to do. He always knows the right uh, person to get you in contact with, to help you with the difficulties that you're going through. God is perfect, and He's holy, and He doesn't make any mistakes. And I'm so excited about that. How many people do you know that are holy, like God is holy? Zero. We don't know anybody who's like that. Our president's not like that. I think he's doing a good job, but he's not holy. You know what? God is holy. And I'm thankful that God stands in contrast to every other person that I know. But he's dependable, and he is holy, and all of that is his grace. Look in verse 18 and 19. Of the same of the same chapter there, the Bible says, "For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed, right? You were not saved. You were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversations received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot." God did not have to send His Son Jesus Christ to shed His blood for you, but He did. Jesus didn't have to come and shed His blood for you. But he did. I am so thankful that God is gracious. And I am so thankful that he is the perfect spotless lamb. That he died on the cross. And when he did so, I'm able to be saved because of what he has done for me. You know, it's fascinating. As you read through the Bible, uh, you pick up on different patterns that are there. And oftentimes, the Bible will command you to do something. And then it will give you the reason why you should do whatever it is that he just commanded you. Most often, the reason to do what He commanded you is the fact that God is good. That's the reason why you should do it. And that's exactly the reason why here in verse number 3, He's saying, If so be, ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious. I hope that you have tasted God's graciousness here today. And if you have, then you should want to do verse number 2. Right? So we see the cause for growth here. The cause for growth is because the Lord is good. And the Lord is gracious, and the Lord is merciful, and He is kind, and He is loving. He's tender, he's compassionate, and all of those different things. He is holy. Have you tasted that the Lord is gracious? All right, we've seen the cause for growth. Now let us see the command, the command in verse number 2. All right, look at it in your Bibles, 1 Peter chapter number 2. In verse number 2, the Bible says, As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that ye may grow thereby. All right, so question, all right? This is open for anybody, all right? Everybody look up here. What is the command that is given to us in verse number 2? All right? We'll read the verse again, and then I want you to tell me what the command is. I'll tell you, I'll give you a hint. It is not to grow. The command is not to grow. Okay? All right, let's read it again, and then after I read it, if you think you know what the command is, I want you to shout it out. All right? The Bible says, As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. What is the command? Desire. desire. To desire. Absolutely. You got it all the way down here. Fantastic. Now, God doesn't tell you to grow. I wonder why. Would you would you come up here for a minute? What's your name? Josiah. Josiah, come all the way up here on the top with me for a minute, Josiah. 
Josiah. All right, everybody look up here at Josiah. All right, Josiah, how old are you? Ten. All right, you think you can do something for me? Think so. You think so? All right, that sounds good. I'm going to stand down here. All right, Josiah, I want you to muster all the strength that you can together, okay? And I want you, right now, I want you to grow two inches. <laughs> Go ahead, go ahead. We're waiting. You, I thought you were going to help me. <laughs> Josiah, you're letting me down. Huh? You said you think so. All right, thank you very much. You can have some. I appreciate it very much. I asked him to do something that was impossible. You know, God never tells us to do things that are impossible, and that's why God doesn't tell you to grow. Because you can't, you can't make yourself grow, can you? We might want to be able to, but you just can't make yourself grow. So the command that he gives here in chapter number 2 is to desire, and then the result of being obedient to that command is that you'll end up growing. Okay, so Growth is a result of desiring the Word of God. Okay, And that's what it says there in verse number 2. So look at it there. It says, it's a neat little play on words. It says, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the Word, that you may grow thereby. All right, so the title of the message was Do Whatever It Takes to Grow. All right, so in order to grow, you need to desire what? This book. You need to desire the Bible. And if you'll desire the Bible and you'll spend time in the Bible, guess what's going to happen? You're going to grow. That is a promise from the teaching of the Bible. Amen. Desire. The Bible. Now, we know what it means to desire something, don't we? We all have desires, okay? It's, it's a neat picture here that's given. It talks about a baby. What does a baby desire? Well, babies, babies are just very interesting creatures, aren't they? They've, they've only got one thing on their mind. They want to eat all the time. They desire milk. And when they drink that milk, their body takes over the natural processes, they digest the nutrients that are there, and then they grow because they're taking in that milk every day, every day, every day. And the Bible's teaching us the same thing, that we need to be like babies. We need to desire the Word of God like a baby desires milk. That's a pretty strong desire, isn't it? Those babies cry, they want that milk. They are going to get that milk. And the Bible says we need to be the same way. That's a pretty good picture to have in our mind, isn't it? We need to be desiring the Word of God. We need to be desiring the Word of God. I used to think that this verse was talking about baby Christians, right? You know, if you were a baby Christian, then you needed to desire the Word of God. But that is not what the Bible is teaching here. The Bible is talking to all Christians of all age levels and all ranges of experience. And he says, look, if you're a Christian, then you need to be like a newborn baby and you need to be desiring the Word of God. The result of the intake of the milk of the Word is growth. Do whatever it takes to grow. If you'll read the book, you'll grow. Now, I was thinking about this. We support... Uh, at our church, we support a missionary. Um, I think his name is Mr. Edens, right? One to Niger, West Africa. Uh, we support this missionary who goes overseas, and he's in Africa, and uh, he stopped giving out Bibles um, quite, quite a while ago. He still gives out the hard copies of the Bibles. But you know what he does? He gives out the Bible on MP3. It's a fascinating thing, right? He gives them the, the media, you know, anybody can go and download an audible version of the Bible today. You can go and just get a copy of it somewhere. And uh, you can have uh, the Bible read to you in your home. As you're laying in bed going to sleep, you can be listening to the Bible. You know what? That would be a solution to the desire to read the Bible. You know? Uh, you could, you could uh, read the Bible for yourself. You could have the Bible uh, be read to you and you could follow along with it. You could be driving down the road and you could be listening to the Bible. There are so many different avenues to be able to obey this command today that there is no excuse that we have to not be listening to the Word of God. We ought to be saturated with this book. And we need to be desiring it. We need to be craving to be in the Word. So the command there is to desire God. All right? 
I think everybody's pretty tired, aren't you? Either y'all are tired or I'm boring, one or the other, all right? And I'm not sure which. Maybe it's a combination of both, all right? But, all right, I got one more point to say because we've got to cover verse number one and then I'm going to be done, okay? Everybody look up here just for a minute. I don't think I've said anything today so far that you didn't already know. Everybody knows God's good, don't you? I didn't have to prove that to you, but I did because that's what the Bible is doing, okay? Everybody knows that you should be reading the Bible, don't you? All right? We've talked about that before in this week, okay? Now, let me ask you this. Those of us who've been Christians for a long time, you know that God's good. You know that you need to be in His Word. Has there ever been a time where you just didn't want to be? Yeah, I have. Pastor Price is not in his head. Yeah, there are times in our lives where, you know what, we just don't really feel like we ought to be in the book. We've lost that desire. We've lost the desire to be in the book. And when that's taking place, I can tell you that you're not growing because you're not being obedient to verse 2, so you're not going to have the result of growth. Okay. Now, verse 1 tells us why many times that's the case. Why we know that we should be reading the Bible, but we're not. All right. So let's take a look at it. All right. We need a catalyst sometimes to get our Bible reading going again. To restore that desire to read the Bible. Look at it, chapter 2 and verse 1. And then I'm done here in just a couple of minutes. The Bible says, Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and evil speakings, desire the sincere milk of the world. You know what this Bible verse is saying? This Bible verse is saying, If you're holding on to the sinful things that are mentioned there in verse number 1, there's no way. There is no way that you can have the desire to be in this book. It's an absolute impossibility. There is no way if your life is characterized by malice, guile, hypocrisies, envies, and evil speaking that you're going to want to be in this book. It's impossible. So the Bible says we need to lay those things aside. All right. Now what does it mean to lay aside? Everybody look up here just for a minute. I'm going to lay aside my suit coat. All right. Feel better already, Pastor Price. Look there. What did I just do? Lay it aside. I laid it aside. What does that mean? Put it off. I put it off. I got rid of it. Right? I got rid of it. I got it out of my life. I don't want that anymore. Okay? This is what the Bible says. Listen, lay aside malice. You know what malice is? I looked it up in one commentary and he said, you know what, malice is just general badness. Anything that you would be that would be characterized by badness. Include vice, drugs, alcohol, immorality, anything and everything that's just bad would be characterized by this term malice. The Bible says you've got to lay it aside. You gotta lay it aside. You know, if you want to grow, if you want to grow in something that is holy, you can't be holding on to something that is unholy. It just it, it just doesn't make sense. There's got to be a choice that's involved there. If I want to have desire to be in this book, I've got to let go of some things. I've got to get rid of some things in my life so that I can desire this book. If I'm going to grow in that which is holy, I've got to get that which is unholy out of my life. Guile, hypocrisies, claiming to be something that you're not. Listen, there's no room for that in Christianity. You need to be who you say that you are. You need to be the real thing. There's no room for hypocrisy. There's no room for guile. What is guile? Guile is deception. Listen, young people, you ought to always tell your parents the truth. Always, always, always tell your parents the truth. Always tell your spouse the truth. Always be truthful. Always tell the truth to your employer, whoever you work for. There's no room for guile. There's no room for deception. If you are practicing deception in your life, the Bible says that you need to lay it aside. That's what the Bible is teaching us here in verse number 1. The Bible says to lay aside envies, which is jealousy over another's success. And the Bible says to lay aside all evil speakings. That just kind of sums it all up, right? Anything that's evil, anything that you're saying and doing that's wrong and that's evil, you need to lay that aside. You know what? If you're holding on to these things, I can promise you something that's not true. You are not desiring to be in the book. You're not desiring to be in the book. You may read the book, but you're having to force yourself to. If you want to have a love for this book, and you want a desire to be in this book, you need to get rid of sin in your life. Get rid of sin. 
You know, I've heard preachers say before that sin will keep you from this book, or this book will keep you from sin. Well, that's exactly what the Bible's teaching us here in 1 Peter chapter 2. If you want to have a desire for the Word of God, give it of the sin in your life, and then start growing in that which is holy. Desire. Desire. That's the command here. That's your job. Your job is to desire, to want to, a deep-seated craving to be in this book. And why would we not want to learn more about a God that is so good? I want to know everything that I can about Him. I want to be able to sing to Him. No, I'm not going to make you sing again. But I want to sing, and I want to sing with gusto because God is good and He's worthy of my worship. And I want to grow in the Lord. I want to know more about Him. I hope that every person in this room wants to grow in the Lord. The title of the message is Do Whatever It Takes to Grow. So I don't know, maybe as I'm speaking here today, the Lord has put His finger on something in your life and He said, you know what, this right here, you need to lay it aside. Maybe it's a TV show that you're watching. You need to stop watching that show, whatever it may be. A practice that you have in your life, some sinful habit. He's put His finger on it, the God's put His finger on it and said, you need to lay that aside if you want to have a desire for this book. Whatever it is, do whatever it takes to grow and lay it aside. Get rid of it and desire the Word of God. I think I'm out of time and past the time that I should have been. So let's close with a word of prayer. Lord, I thank you for your Word, for the teaching and instruction that it gives to us. Father, help us to do whatever it takes to grow. Lord, help us to choose that which is holy over that which is unholy. Lord, we love you. And in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, thank you for your attention. Stand up and do jumping jacks or something so you can wake up. Thank you guys for that.